Hi, welcome to Ventura Vineyards online service. I'm Erica, your service host, which means I get to tell you that this morning we are going to start with some worship and then I'll be back to talk through our offering and a few announcements. Then we get to hear our message followed by a little more worship together and then we'll wrap it up. So let's get started. Shelby, we are ready to join you in worship. Good morning. So, of course, we are in the season of Advent. So I have my own uh, colorful interpretation of Advent candles. This represents a time of waiting and expectation, preparing ourselves for the birth of Messiah, and a reminder to wait in hopeful expectation for a return. Last Sunday, Jared lit the candle representing hope for us. And today I will be lighting the candle representing peace. So the Messiah, as we know, is peace. Not just bringing us peace, but being peace itself. This peace does not just mean being free from war or conflict. It is actual shalom. It is wholeness, complete welfare, and safety. Jesus has taught us by saying, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled. Do not let them be afraid. And Paul has also reminded us by saying, Do not be anxious about everything, or anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests, your heart yearnings, be made known to God. And the peace of God and the Messiah will guard your hearts and your minds. Shalom has come to bring peace into our hearts, our centers of being, our families and communities, and the world in which we live. This peace can heal division and bring wholeness to brokenness. This time of Advent reminds us to live in this hope and expectation of the great Shalom. Sing out your voice, it thunders. Here we go. Your voice, it thunders. The oaks start twisting. Forest sounds with cedars breaking. The waters see you and start their rising. From the depths, a song is rising. Now it's rising from the ground. Holy, 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 holy Lord, the earth is yours and singing. Holy, 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 holy. Your voice, it thunders, the ground is shaking, mighty mountains now are trembling. Creation sees you and starts composing, fields and trees, they start rejoicing. Rising from the ground, sing it again. Now it's rising from the ground. Holy, 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 holy Lord, the earth is yours and singing. Holy, holy. Yours. The earth is yours. The earth is yours. 
back to that holy holy and feel free to sing it out or move your bodies around here we go holy 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 lord nice job let's do it again holy One more time, here we singing, holy, 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 holy Lord. Now it's rising from the ground, now it's rising from the ground. Now it's rising from the ground, here is crying. Welcome back. It's time for offering and announcements. We'll start by talking about the offering. I'll direct your attention to the Ventura Vineyard app. If you don't have the app yet, you can download it from all the stores, the App Store, the Play Store, uh, all the stores. Once you're in the app, go ahead and click on the Give tile and you can follow the simple prompts there to set up either a one-time donation or an ongoing donation as you choose to. Join me in a prayer for the offering. Almighty Creator, we uh, lift this offering to you with our intention to align with yours, that these resources may be sown into your kingdom, Lord, for your purposes and um, thank you for the abundance that you bestow on us today and every day. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, I have three announcements for you this morning, so I am going to refer to my notes, which I have handy here, to make sure I get all the details to you correctly. So the first announcement is regarding our Guatemala Christmas drive. Um, Bob talked about this last week, and um, let me give you a few of the details. Uh, our church has a very special connection with a couple and their staff who run an orphanage in Guatemala, where they take care of 30 children there who were abused or abandoned. And this year, we want to do something very special for them. Our, our, our intention of this drive is to raise $30 per child so that we can uh, send the money to Guatemala where 100% of the money will be um, spent on the child's needs, things they might need or want, but their, their specific items um, are in mind. So again, 100% of this goes to the kids. And um, once the money gets down there, they're going to shop locally so they can so that money into their local economy and um, we get to support Guatemala in multiple ways with this drive. So on our give tile, there is a special line in the drop down menu, which of course you already looked at because you just did it in the offering. Um, and uh, this Christmas drive is, there's a special line in there. So if you uh, prefer a check, you may also send in donations that way, but it's really easy to give on the tile, on the give tile, on the app. Super easy. It's secure and um, and easy. So the deadline to donate is December 20th. Uh, that will allow them time to receive the money and purchase the gifts before Christmas. So announcement number two. This is a reminder about our Blue Christmas service. 
this is going to be held on Sunday the 13th, so next week, uh, at 7 p.m. And it's going to be held just like this on our YouTube channel. There will be a link, um, and that's where you will see it. So the Christmas season um, can be a really difficult time for a lot of reasons, um, but it's a time of the year where um, loss is felt with perhaps more weight um, because it's Christmas. <laughs> so um, you may not feel like celebrating this Christmas very much, um, but you may you may very much want the hope that really only comes from God. So this service is a chance to um, honor our feelings of loss and other heavy emotional stuff because life and stuff, their stuff, um, it offers a way to acknowledge our feelings and to really feel surrounded by the compassionate love of God. Kathy has put on this service for many years. Thank you, Kathy. I'm very excited about it this year. And um, the bottom line is that it's remembering that no matter the times and even during a year like 2020, that's 17 years long, um, we can remember every day that God is with us. So, oh, a last note about the Blue Christmas service. Um, the service is only going to last 24 hours. It'll only be up for a short period of time. So the experience that is intimate and sharing of feelings and whatever, it's not going to be on the interwebs forever, but for a very short time. Okay, the next and final announcement I have for you is regarding our parking lot sale. Uh, this is going to be on Saturday, December 12th. So before the blue Christmas service, it's a little bit out of order, but on Saturday, uh, we're relocating right from suite A, which is our larger space into suite J next door. And we have a lot of supplies and furnishings that must go stuff like children's ministry supplies, games, toys, craft supplies, books, Bibles, office supplies, electronics, art, costume pieces, tables, desks, couches, kitchen and cafe supplies, and lots more. That's a lot of stuff, but there's even more stuff than that. So please uh, come and also tell your friends. Um, all of the leftover items will be donated to the Boys and Girls Thrift Store in Ventura, and money collected from the sale is going to be used to renovate our new community space. So the sale will be held outside in the parking lot at 1956 Palma Drive in Ventura. Please wear a mask. Please observe social distancing. Please bring cash or checks only because that's all that will be accepted. And um, donation receipts will be provided as requested. So looking forward to that. There's a lot of cool stuff. I've seen some of the stuff. It's, it's great. You want to bring cash. Lots and lots of cash. Okay, uh, you can find more information about all of these announcements uh, on our website and on the app, so you can get the details in case you missed it. But of course now, this is on YouTube, you can go back after the meeting, after the meeting, you can watch this and get the details there. But whatever I missed is on the website and on the app. So now let me turn you over to Richard Sockle, who's continuing our new series, you have a seat at the table with today's message entitled Placemaking is Peacemaking. I had to look at that twice because it's an alliteration. And also I almost said peacemaking is placemaking, but that's not it. It's placemaking is peacemaking. Thank you, Richard. Here we go. Richard Sockle here, a member of your teaching team, bringing you today's message. And so welcome to the second Sunday in Advent and the second Sunday 
of our series, You Have a Seat at the Table. So happy holidays and Merry Christmas. Can you believe the holidays are here? I'm still uh, trying to wrap my head around that. And what a year it has been. So for those of you who are part of our regular Ventura Vineyard community, welcome back. And if you're a visitor, if you found us online or somebody invited you into this space today, it's great to have you with us. So I'm going to be bringing us the message today. And um, I'm going to be talking about placemaking and peacemaking. And that's the title of my message today. Placemaking is peacemaking. And so this will be a, um, a little bit different in that I don't simply want us to think about and reflect on these themes. I also want us to experience them. So we will have a chance towards the end of the message to actually do that and hopefully, maybe just a little bit, experience what it means to have a seat at the table. And I mean in a very personal and experiential way. So we'll do that. And I also have a story to talk about uh, from a children's book. So that will be coming towards the end as well. So it won't just be my talking head for the entire duration of the message. So good news. <laughs> good news for you on that. So um, yeah, so welcome back everybody to, uh, to our season of Advent. We, we lit the peace candle today. And so I'd like to connect that theme, the idea of peace in our Advent season with our series theme, which is that you have a seat at the table. So placemaking is peacemaking. I'm going to be using some words interchangeably. So I just want to say that um, right off the bat. So table sharing, meal sharing, placemaking, I'm going to kind of use those words interchangeably. Um, and I want to examine some of the famous stories where we see Jesus sharing meals with others in the Gospels. And I would like to sort of uh, overlay that with some of the historical background of what that actually meant, what it meant to share a meal or to share a table with someone in the ancient world and how that has implications for us today. And then towards the very, very end, I have a, a challenge for us. Should you choose to accept it, I have a couple of thoughts and suggestions about what we can do moving forward. So let us begin the message. So placemaking is peacemaking. So I'd like to start with a very famous story of Jesus sharing a meal with some of his friends. And this is from the 13th chapter in the Gospel of John, and it is the Last Supper. Yes, very famous and well-known meal gathering that Jesus celebrated with his friends and with people who were close to him. So let's pick that up, John chapter 13, and I'm going to read verses 1 through 18. It was just before the Passover festival. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The evening meal was in progress, and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power, and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and he began to wash the disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, You do not realize now what I am doing, but later you will understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, Unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Then, Lord, Simon Peter replied, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. Jesus answered, those who have had a bath need only to wash their feet. Their whole body is clean. And you are clean, though not every one of you. For he knew who was going to betray him, 
and that was why he said, Not everyone was clean. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly, I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. So in the Gospels, there are a lot of different examples of Jesus having meals with people. And this is a time for us too. I mean, meal sharing and getting together and eating, like that's a big deal even for us today. It was certainly a big deal back then. And so um, in preparing the message today, I just um, just kind of digging into the, the historical background and, and kind of understanding the cultural context. It really brought some of these meal sharing stories to life for me and gave me a much greater appreciation for what was going on. And I hope that is something that can happen for you today as well. So let's just take a couple of steps back and, and sort of look at meal sharing in the ancient world. And we'll sort of compare that to how Jesus did things. And I think you will see that there's quite a departure from social conventions and norms in the way Jesus does it and with the purposes that he has in mind as he's relating to people. So <clears throat> the first thing I think to look at is just understanding what was this meal sharing thing like in the ancient world. So we would have to go back to the Greeks and the Romans to kind of <clears throat> have a, a little bit greater depth of understanding as to what was going on. But essentially, <clears throat> there were several dynamics that were going on in the ancient world. So one of the dynamics or aspects of meal sharing in the ancient context was that it was really a boys club. It was really male oriented and male dominated. So it was for the men. And if women were participating in the meal, it was really only to serve. Or in the context of the rich and the elite, women were there to provide services, if you know what I mean. And so <clears throat> this male orientation and domination was a big part of it. Another part of it was that like ate with likes. So if you were invited to a meal, it meant that you were one of the crowd. And so it was a way, in a sense, of signing the social contract. So it meant that if you were sharing a table together or a meal together, that you were allies. That means that when bad times come for you, I'm there to help you. When bad times come for me, you're there to help me. So it was about alliances and contracts. Now, in addition to that, in the, the very elite circles, it was a way of demonstrating your wealth, and your power, and it was also very sensual. So there was a lot of drinking, I mean a lot of drinking, heavy drinking, <laughs> and there were women there who were performing services. Again, if you know what I mean, it meant that it was very sensual and licentious, and it was also created with the intent or the purpose to keep the status quo as is, to keep things the way they are. So you only would associate with people in your tribe or your group, and it meant that you were part of that tribe or group, and it was a way to reinforce, strengthen, and perpetuate the way things are. There was not <clears throat> mixing of social classes or different classes of people. So you can, for example, think of that famous banquet that Herod threw for his officials and the leading men of the, uh, of the region. And um, he had the daughter of Herodias there and she danced for him. And so it was probably more akin to a pole dance than ballet. And so there was lots of drinking and it was about establishing um, his 
place as a ruler and as somebody in charge and in control. And all of the people who were allied with him got to enjoy the benefits of that. Unfortunately, John the Baptist lost his head over the situation. It's a very sad and tragic story. But you can kind of see in that example these different things that I'm talking about. So <clears throat> the other aspect of this is that when we see Jesus, and again, this is comparing and contrasting, when we see Jesus having a meal with people, it's much more open and it's much different. So the idea here that I would like to get across is that there was closed systems, that these dynamics, that these places were closed, these systems were closed, and that was a problem. So, of course, the, the opposite of that is to have open systems, being open-handed, open-minded, and open-hearted to people who were not a part of your class. So in the text that we read, we have a lot of very interesting and different things when we compare and contrast that, that to, again, the way things done were in the ancient world in the classical meal or the classical sense. So roles are very important at these gatherings. Typical roles are these three. You have the host, you have the honored guest or the special guest, and you have the rest of the guests. There were other people there, but they were there only to serve or to provide some type of services um, or to essentially watch what was going on. They weren't invited to participate in what was happening at the meal. And so servants who were there and who were serving, they would do things like washing the feet of the guests or putting oil on the head of the guest. So contrast the, you know, the, the Last Supper with this classical model, and I think you get to, to see that there's quite a lot of differences and distinctions because Jesus is opening things up. He's going against the social norms and the social conventions. Now, when we think about the Last Supper and this idea that Jesus would wash the feet of the disciples, you see that Jesus is turning things on their head, and that is the kingdom. He's going against the particular social order, and he's creating a new order. Meekness is not weakness, but it's strength contained for the sake of others. And Jesus is he's demonstrating meekness and humility and saying, this, guys, is how we should do it and how we should treat one another. This is really the way to party. This is the way we should be when we get together because placemaking in this way is peacemaking because it is shalom. It's, rest, it's restoration. It's restoring. It's restoring people back to their place of dignity and um, affirming them as people. And that is the dynamic that we see here and this idea of friendship. So when we think about, though, when we go back to the, this scene in The Last Supper, we might think of Leonardo da Vinci's painting. And so I would like to put that slide here. Um, that's actually not <laughs> what it looked like. Um, and so now I have a, another slide, which, which I would like to show you, which is much, probably much more realistic and closer to what it actually looked like. And so we remember that at the Last Supper, this is a Passover meal. And so people were reclining. So the guests at the table, and it might have been wooden, like we see in the image there, or it could have been a cowhide that was maybe an oval or circular. And there were common plates and common dishes in the middle um, from people to, to take of. So they would eat from different dishes, and so they would prop themselves up. On the left hand, and they would use their right hand to take food. They would use bread, and they would dip into probably a stew of some sort with lentils or beans. And of course, this was the Passover, so the Passover elements, each of which have deep meaning, would also be on the table. Things like green herbs or an egg, salt water, and other things. And, um, and then, of course, people uh, would be serving 
and it would be customary for the servants then to wash the feet of the guests. But the servants were doing that, not the host. So again, we see Jesus turning things on their head and him, the king, the king of the, the whole universe is serving and washing the feet of his disciples. It must have just blew their minds, certainly blew Peter's mind. And um, that is quite significant and extraordinary. So there's just a couple of other key points about this Last Supper gathering that I'd like to point out before we move on to a guided meditation so we can experience it for ourselves to a certain extent. Um, so from the, the slide that I showed you with the uh, individuals reclining, this actually then makes the helps us make a lot more sense out of the story because we've got some different dynamics happening. Um, some of the following verses in chapter 13 of John, which I didn't read, show these different dynamics about the conversation between Jesus and John um, when Peter motions to, to John, who is sitting next to Jesus. And note the fact, too, that Judas was also sitting next to Jesus. So this also, this has great significance because the host would put the guests of honor on his left side and on his right side. And so John on the right side, who was reclining, would be able to lean back and have a private conversation with Jesus. So Peter, who's maybe uh, close by, is motioning to John to ask him, who's going to betray you? And John leans back and kind of whispers. And then, the, I always thought that Jesus dipping the bread in the dish was kind of like a secret sign for Peter and for John as to who was going to betray him. Um, I think there's a little bit more to that. And here's why I think that. There's an African proverb that says, you have no enemy with whom you have shared a dish. And also in, in ancient Near Eastern culture, to dip a piece of bread into the dish and then to offer it somebody was one of the highest forms of friendship. That is to say, the offer of friendship in a very public and yeah, concrete way. So the fact that Jesus then took that bread, dipped it in the dish, and gave it to Judas, it has tremendous implications because what it says to me, at least, is that to up to the very end, the last, Jesus was still offering friendship to Judas, and Judas wouldn't have it. So, anyway, just again, kind of seeing that visually gives me a lot more appreciation and understanding of what is going on at this particular gathering and the implications it has for us, knowing that we too have a seat at the table, that we're invited into this very intimate and special place with the Master, where we are affirmed, we are loved, and we are given um, the dignity that we all deserve as human beings, and that is shalom, that is peacemaking. And so placemaking is peacemaking. So from there, what I would like for us to do now is to go into a time with a guided meditation, looking at these verses. And so go ahead and get ready to um, engage in that activity. And I'll, I'm going to go ahead and have that show now. And then we'll return for a few last words. And then we will end with a children's book about peace. Let's begin a guided meditation of the Last Supper from John chapter 13. The idea is to place yourself in the scene and experience it for yourself now in the present. You can be walking while you listen or seated. If seated, Get into a comfortable position and focus on your breathing. Breathe in, breathe out. Close your eyes if it helps. Next, recognize that you are in the presence of the living God, that you are accepted and safe. Now, 
open yourself completely to his love. Imagine yourself in the upper room during that last Passover meal with Jesus. See the foods being served. Lentil stew, lamb, unleavened bread, dates and figs. The Passover elements are on the table. Green herbs, salt, an egg, and other things. Take in the aromas from the burning of oil lamps for light and shades of fragrance like frankincense and myrrh. Notice the people in the room, men and women. Hear the sounds of people eating, drinking, laughing, and talking. Notice the sun setting through the windows and openings in the room. Now, focus on Jesus. What is he doing? What does he look like? What is the expression on his face? Notice where you are in relation to where Jesus is reclining. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. Stay with the foot-washing part of the scene for a moment. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Now, think about these questions. What strikes you? What things or people in the scene stand out? What is this about in my life? What is God showing me or saying to me? What positive feelings did you experience? Were you able to let Jesus serve you? Did you feel the offer of friendship? What was it like to be in Jesus' presence? Negative feelings or negative thoughts, perhaps? Thoughts like, I shouldn't be at the table? I'm not worthy to have my feet washed? Consider the moment when Jesus offered Judas the piece of bread he dipped in the dish. Offering someone bread from your dish signified friendship. Judas took the bread but inwardly he rejected the deeper offer. Until the end, Jesus was offering friendship to his betrayer, perhaps still hoping that Jesus would accept, sorry, that Judas would accept his offer. One conclusion from this offer to Judas is that it is never too late to accept invitations. Jesus has invitations for us that nothing we have done or thought can't be overcome by his grace, patience, and love. 
Judas ate a thousand meals with Jesus, and that the last one had his feet washed by him, the Messiah. Yet he walked away from all of that for 30 pieces of silver. He took the money instead. Jesus was not the kind of Messiah he wanted. And with that, we end our guided meditation. Well, welcome back, and I hope that that experience was meaningful for you. So that was kind of a combination of imaginative prayer and Lexio Dabina thrown in. And I hope that that had some rich and deep meaning for you and that it was transformative in some way. So now, let me just kind of um, present to you and to us a challenge. You know, we're in the process of making a new place for our community. We're moving from one place to another. And so I just want to, I guess, put a seed out there that, hey, we have an opportunity to create a place and a space that is welcoming and inviting. I also want to present to us today a challenge for us individually or maybe even as families that we would go into spaces and places that we may not ordinarily go to. Because after all, I think we can take away from these various stories where Jesus is sharing a meal or sharing a table with someone that he's inviting them in. And it's a very different kind of person space head space, soul space, and um, yeah, and so I would like to present us with a challenge to do that. Now, we're in the middle of a pandemic, so it's really hard to invite people right now. It's just not, not a safe thing to do, and so even our gatherings this year, they look really different. I don't know how yours are going to look, but maybe it's going to be a virtual space, and uh, that presents an opportunity, though, and so here's something that I've done, and I realized as I was preparing this message today, I didn't want to ask you to do something that I haven't done or wasn't prepared to do. So I'm right there with you. And so in just doing some self-examination, you know, I realized that there's some attitudes and, and ideas that I have about particular groups of people that are not right, that they need to change. And I need to, to find some, some healing and restoration in my own, my own soul regarding this. And so what I decided to do, and some of you who know me know that I do come from a Jewish background, um, I can remember instances sitting around the table with, with family where some very inappropriate, disparaging, negative remarks were made about Arab people and uh, more generally about Muslims. So what I decided to do is to put myself in a space where ordinarily I would never set foot. And I did this in a digital space. And so I joined two Islamic groups with the only intention of going to learn, to appreciate, and to grow. And so I just wanted to share with you that that has been a very different, interesting, and also rewarding experience for me. I, as I said, I wouldn't ordinarily inhabit that space, but I decided that I was going to kind of bust out of my comfort zone and I was going to interact with people who were different than me, who thought different from me, and who might even be hostile toward me. And so my experience so far has been that there have been some awkward <laughs> moments. There have been some, some hurtful moments, but by and large and overall, I have been surprised at how much I have been embraced and accepted in these Muslim or Islamic spaces. So I just, I share that with you to say again that I'm not asking you to do anything that I haven't done. And we can look at this, you know, as a church community as a whole, and we can also look at it individually and as families. So you might have some ideas, and I would love to hear about your experiences. So email me or let us know on the Ventura Vineyard 
community uh, site there on Facebook. And uh, let's share our experiences about going into a different space. That is to say, we are going to a place and in that we are making peace. We are making shalom. So I'd like to now read a book by Todd Parr called The Peace Book, and then I'll come back with some final thoughts. The Peace Book by Todd Parr. Peace is making new friends. Peace is keeping the water blue for all the fish. Peace is listening to different kinds of music. Peace is saying you're sorry when you hurt someone. Peace is helping your neighbor. Peace is reading all different kinds of books. Peace is thinking about someone you love. Peace is giving shoes to someone who needs them. Peace is planting a tree. Peace is sharing a meal. Peace is wearing different clothes. Peace is watching it snow. Peace is keeping the streets clean. Peace is offering a hug to a friend. Peace is everyone having a home. Peace is growing a garden. Peace is taking a nap. Peace is learning another language. Peace is having enough pizza in the world for everyone. Peace is keeping someone warm. Peace is new babies being born. Peace is being free. Peace is traveling to different places. Peace is wishing on a star. Peace is being who you are. Peace is being different, feeling good about yourself, and helping others. The world is a better place because of you. So thank you so much for being here today and listening to this message about placemaking and peacemaking. And I just would like to read a final verse from John 15, 15 from the NLT. I no longer call you slaves because a master doesn't confide in his slaves. Now you are my friends since I have told you everything the Father told me. So as we come to our seat at the table, as we receive the invitation that Jesus offers us for friendship, for fellowship, for goodness, for affirmation, and all those wonderful game changers, let us also open our own hearts and minds and hands to invite and also to go into spaces where we might not ordinarily go so that we can bring shalom and be shalom in this very difficult time and in this wonderful season of Christmas. So peace to you and to your loved ones. No!
And that brings us to the end of our service today. You're invited to join us for the meeting after the meeting on our Zoom channel. This is an opportunity to connect live, to talk about the message, or just share what's on your mind. The link is in the description. Thank you so much for joining us. 
See you next time.